I am not one to usually get very into indie shows or just shows in general. When a new thing drops and literally the entire internet is talking about it, for some reason I just never watch it because, I don't know, I have trouble finding the time to watch stuff, especially if it's an entire show. And there are only a select few shows that I'm physically able to connect with enough to get really into it. And I'm not gonna lie, this sounds really pessimistic and dumb, but it starts to piss me off after a while the more I hear about it, especially with indie shows. I feel like the internet has the tendency to overhype things to the point where they die out really soon and are honestly difficult to enjoy without having flashbacks to the horrific things you've seen on the internet already. When I heard about the release of the amazing digital circus, I was like, okay, another thing for everyone to talk about and for me to illogically dislike whenever I see it on my For You. But I was particularly bored one evening and I was lying in bed and I was like, huh, I'm not really tired yet and there's some time before my mentally determined weekly bedtime and I'm sick of scrolling through Instagram reels and sending torrents of cat videos to my friends. So I switched to the YouTube tab and I was like, fuck, okay, fine, I'll watch the circus video, goddammit. And honestly, I quite liked it from the pilot alone. It wasn't the type of thing I'd get really into, but as I saw more stuff relating to it floating around the internet, more and more thoughts about it started to accumulate in my head and I was like, huh, there's a couple of thoughts that I'd like to share with the general public about this. So very briefly, what is The Amazing Digital Circus? The Amazing Digital Circus is a pilot dropped on YouTube on October 13th. I'd classify it as a comedy and psychological horror following a girl in a jester outfit who found herself trapped in a chaotic digital circus world with very little recollection of how she got there and who she even is. The circus ringmaster dubs her Pomni as she legitimately cannot remember her real name, and this pilot follows her exploration of this freaky creepy world. So I'm going to split this video into four sections. Plot slash world building, characters, theories, and critiques. There'll be timestamps in the description if there's a specific thing that you're here for. Otherwise, I'm going to kick it off. The plot and world building. The main premise of this pilot was to introduce the audience to the digital circus and the place that it's set in. It's essentially set in a computer. We can gather this from the intro itself. You can see it pan from a very low res computer graphic to the 3D art style used throughout the video and from the very end where it flat out shows you. It is based off of a short story and video game, I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream. Most of the characters minus the NPCs are real humans trapped in this digital world in bodies that do not reflect their real world counterparts. All of them have been there for various amounts of time and have learned to handle the situation in different ways. I find the premise of the show so far really interesting and promising. I really like the energy given off by the chosen art style, and I feel like the way they utilized bright colors but also managed to come off as unsettling at the same time was very well crafted. It's a very unique style, which is a token trait of indie content in general. I think a huge part of why it blew up so fast to such a large audience is because of the art style being so recognizable and unique. I know that part of the reason I got off my ass and watched it was because I kept seeing clips of it floating around and generally enjoyed the art style from what I was seeing. The pilot was really straightforward and left you with a good balance of, oh, that was kind of weird, as well as widespread enough questions like, what is the deal with the void? What was the deal with that thing on the wall? How will they escape? but not so widespread that you're confused and in turn disinterested, which I feel like is how I felt watching the pilot release of multiple other indie shows, where they're just too vague for me to be interested or care enough about what happens to the characters or storyline. There was enough mystery for a series to be built on top of this and for questions to be later answered, but not so much that the viewer can't quite grasp what is going on here, which I liked, props to that. The contrast between what is in the tent and places like the void and the exit maze and the very last scene is also really well done. The circus itself is so cluttered and bright and, well, fake looking, whereas the difference between that and those pre-mentioned places is that they aren't. They bring you some sort of grounding and remind you repeatedly that this place isn't real. And on top of that, this place isn't finished. When Pomni stumbles through the exit maze, Kane explains himself that he was trying to incorporate an exit in, but he genuinely didn't know what to put on the other side. This is a map that Kane is still constructing, but why? Why is he trying so hard to entertain these people and adding on to this circus to make it fun if years have gone by and it's repeatedly shoved in his face that nobody will enjoy anything he does and they will keep on hating it until their point of breakdown? That I'll theorize about later on, but it's generally an interesting thing to think about and something that Glitch did a pretty good job of making you think about. The plot overall mixes psychological horror and comedy in a really interesting nifty way, but there's more thoughts I want to share on that that fit into a later category. So now let's talk about the characters. Okay, so when I first watched this, my initial thought was that my favorite character was Jax. I felt like he was the most effortlessly funny and I had a pretty spontaneous affinity towards him. But later thinking about it, I realized that I think my favorite character would honestly be Kinger. So I'm going to talk about him first. So as confirmed by Gooseworks, Kinger is a 48 year old man and he came here with a wife named Queenie, who later either died or abstracted. 
as we can see by one of the doors being crossed out with a queen chess piece on it. I feel like these two tidbits of information make me really like Kinger as a character much more than I did initially. He's more than just silly and easily scared, he straight up lost his girl. Or sister, but presumably wife since king and queen and whatever. Uh, since coming here, and when Dax says that he's the most mentally stable there, I initially took that as a joke, but I can also kind of see that now, considering how much he has been through and the fact that he's still here and participating in all this madness and hasn't given up and abstracted. In fact, if he did abstract, he may lose form, but he'd at least be able to see what happens after and be with Queenie, but he chooses to keep going even though there's no visible escape. All the other humans here are significantly younger than him. He's experienced much more life than they have, and the most time in the digital circus. Have you ever seen a 48-year-old man trying to connect with a 22-year-old? It's not particularly easy. It wouldn't be surprising if Kinger had a family and a set job and a really developed life before he got here. And the way that he's handling it is honestly very respectable. Pomni is going bonkers within a day and this man is still on his A-game. Where is the Kinger love? Come on, guys. So now let's talk about Pomni, since she's our main character. I honestly didn't feel much attachment to Pomni, since her personality doesn't seem very flushed out yet. She's mostly just confused and disoriented, which makes sense, and I think part of the intention was for the viewer to sort of project themselves onto her, as she's new to this whole world just as we are. Her design was on top. I love the choices made with her appearance, especially her facial expression switching from baseline to sullen really fluidly. The art style used on Pomni is so cute. <laughs> The scene where she abandoned Ragatha was heavily debated, but personally I quite liked it. It shows that she's more human than anything else. She doesn't know these people, and she saw a demonstration of what state she'd be in if she tried to help. It's not that she's mean, but she is set on survival and wants to find a way out and get back to her real life. Imagine if Pomni was you. If there were things going on in your world that were in progress or unfinished, your school, your job, your relationships with others, would you sacrifice yourself for someone you just met in a computer world? when there's nothing you can visibly do in that moment to help them. And she clearly does care to an extent, because when the visible danger is gone, she commits herself to helping Ragatha, the only thing distracting her being a visible exit. Not to mention she apologizes later on, and Ragatha accepts this apology. Despite being told numerous times that there just isn't an exit, she dedicates her whole self to finding it, only breaking down when she finds herself floating into a seemingly endless void of nothing. Next, let's talk about Jax. Other than the voice actor being familiar, Jax had what can only be described as a very likable character design. Design, not personality. <laughs> I liked that while others tried to handle their situation by trying to make the best out of it, he just straight up does not care. I like that they didn't make him the lovable jerk, they just made him a jerk. At the end of the day, he doesn't really care about these people. He seemingly doesn't care that Kofmo abstracted, he doesn't care about the adventures of the games, he doesn't care about comforting Pomni. It doesn't matter to him. Presumably upon realizing that there was no escape and this was his new home, he lost drive or motivation to try. He hasn't fully given up because he hasn't abstracted yet, but he has a very baseline cheery personality that is pretty much unchanging throughout the whole pilot no matter what he's going through. He pretty much realized that the only apparent danger here is the danger of abstraction. If he doesn't abstract and he keeps away from anyone who does, he won't die or have the nearest equivalent happen to him and that seems to be his only general goal. He does seem to be friendly with the other characters, but not to an extent where he truly cares about what happens to them. Knowing that Ragatha's worst fear was centipedes shows that he did get to know her, but that didn't stop him from messing with her, that wasn't enough for him to comfort her when she was having her breakdown, and he ran away from Kafma without a moment's hesitation to see what happened to her. It feels like he's talking to others to pass the time, but he doesn't really care about what happens which is both comedic and also kind of sad in a way. What about Ragatha? Honestly, I wasn't a huge fan of her. Her whole thing seems to be that she's trying to stay positive and keep a level head and be logical and put on a happy face for others, but it's actually deep down really close to her breaking point. A character like that is pretty necessary, I think, to introduce you to this kind of plot, but not one that I can emotionally connect with to any significant extent. There's probably more to come and more personality building in store for her, but from the glimpse we had in her pilot, she felt really straightforward. As for Zubal, Zubal handles this situation in a different way, where she's wholeheartedly unenthusiastic, and while she isn't losing her mind, she also just doesn't feel any motivation or desire to participate in Kane's games. She's doing the bare minimum to keep herself sane, but she isn't extending any part of herself. She doesn't want to be here, but like Jax, she's pretty much accepted that there isn't a clear way out. 
Gangle seems to be a very popular character I've seen, or at least one that I've seen a lot of discussion about, which makes sense. I love Gangle. She usually wears a comedy mask, but when it's broken, she becomes an emotional and sad and a mess. The dichotomy with her emotions is really interesting. When her mask is broken, she is miserable, and that is it. It appears how she handles her situation is by wholeheartedly breaking down. It doesn't look like she even really has a reason to like any of these people. Jax treats her badly and doesn't care about her. Ragatha is too caught up in preserving her fragile mental state to pay much heed to her. Zubal is depressed and doesn't extend much effort to connect. Hinger is bonkers and it'd probably be difficult to form a connection with someone who has trouble forming a single coherent sentence and who is so much older than you. And Pomni is too delirious to pay much attention to Gangle either. There's no reason for her to keep her hopes up and all the chaos is probably overwhelming for her. I'm really curious how she functions in real life because it seems like the status of her porcelain mask really affects her mood and I really want to know how she handles things without that variable. I'm also going to talk about Kane, even though he is presumably an AI. Kane does have characteristics that make him feel human, or at least emotionally conscious. For one thing, he genuinely does seem to try and make the cast happy and enthusiastic. He's trying to implement things to keep them physically and emotionally stimulated and somewhat react to their feedback. He seems to simply just not understand what is causing their distress, and also doesn't know how to handle it when they start to break down. His solution for abstracted characters is to toss them in a void and cover them up. It seems like he just keeps trying with the next group and hopes that this time he'll get it right. He seems entirely unable to comprehend what reasoning they have for wanting to leave so badly. It's my belief that he doesn't even know what they're trying to escape to. It's possible he doesn't know or doesn't remember that there is a world beyond this, which would explain why he simply just couldn't figure out what to put on the other side of the exit to the point where he seemingly made it into just another game. I personally don't really see Kane as a villain. He is contributing to the problem, but he doesn't seem to have any malicious intentions. He's just playing his part as a mischievous ringmaster and failing over and over again, and he isn't taking anything as seriously as he should. So now, my theories. So first of all, why is Kane trying so hard to make the experience enjoyable if it never works? If people keep abstracting, blatantly not participating in his games, or even just don't get along with each other super well? Well, first and foremostly, if Kane is an AI, it makes sense that it is in his programming to just be the ringmaster, maintain the circus, occasionally set up adventures to challenge everyone, keep building onto the map to make it more and more fun. It would make sense that it's possibly against his programming to register any further emotional connections. Clearly, he has some sort of machine learning and memory storage because he is able to remember everyone's names, he makes spontaneous decisions based on what's happening, and he has some sort of thought processing going on. But whenever it comes to actually processing the character's emotions, there seems to be some sort of barrier there. It's clear that everyone has been asking and asking for an exit, and when he finally made one, he took it as, he should implement an exit into the map, and not, these people want an actual way out. And he left it unfinished too, it wasn't his top priority, even though it was seemingly was making people abstract. He figured it'd be easier for him to just keep doing his job until ideally everyone was just happy. It doesn't seemingly matter to him if characters abstract. Second theory, what is the digital circus and why does it exist? Now here's where I'll probably start getting details blatantly wrong, and it'll be pretty funny to look back on when we finally know. But what I came up with was that this is an experiment or a game made by a big company, where they took some form of virtual reality even further and designed headsets that allow you to play but it went horribly wrong and people ended up being trapped in this world. It would explain why Pomni is trying to take the headset off at the beginning of the pilot, and how all the humans got there. Picture this, Kinger is a middle-aged man who wanted to try out this new thing with his wife and now they're both stuck here. It would also explain why most of the characters are on the younger side, considering old people old people don't really play those kinds of games. Kane, as forementioned, could be part of the programming, and that's why he just keeps going, because that's what he's meant to do. And he has to do it forever. He doesn't understand the real world because he doesn't know about the real world. What he knows is that he is a ringmaster and his purpose is to maintain the circus. When characters abstract, it could be them physically dissociating from their body, forgetting their connection to the outside world, and dedicating all their energy to destroying the landscape because there's nothing left for them to try. They don't connect with their identity anymore, which would explain why they don't reflect the body that they had before they abstracted. So those are my theories. Last thing I want to talk about, the critiques that I have, which are pretty slim, I would say. This is all opinion that is heavily based on personal preferences, and I'd like you to just bear that in mind. What we've seen is a pilot, a snippet of what is to come, and it's hard to make any concrete judgments that aren't subject to change. 
But anyways, firstly, my critique would be on the execution of the genre in general. Psychological horror and comedy are, are hard to mix, but could be something great if done correctly. The humor feels like occasional gags and such, but I feel like the main focus was intended to be the psychological horror aspects. Because if the main focus was the comedy and the secondary focus was the psychological horror, it's hard to feel in any way unsettled. But I feel like psychological horror can only really stick if it is in some way related to the audience and something that they can feel. It's more than just making the characters go crazy, it's also a bit of making you go crazy too, even if nothing that you're watching is actually directly happening to you. The imagery and themes are supposed to be what's creeping you out, even though they aren't real, physical dangers. You're scared, but you're scared because of what they'll do to your mind and identity, not that they'll just jump scare you or that there'll be any sort of blood and gore. I feel like that was what this pilot was going for, but I also feel like that isn't what this pilot did. I didn't really feel scared after watching this. I didn't contemplate it as I walked about my day. I had fun analyzing the characters and theorizing about what happens next, but I wasn't very unsettled, even though that felt like it was kind of the point. Yeah, the scary abstraction monsters were creepy, and yeah, the theme of being trapped in a computer is creepy, but none of it really makes me reflect on my own life, unless there's something that I missed. There are occasions when I feel trapped, and there are even occasions where I feel like nothing is real, but this pilot didn't connect to those experiences for me. I felt like I was watching a story, but not a story that connected to me. It felt like the focus was more on the world building than introducing you to the actual energy this show is going to later give off. I've seen psychological horror content before, which had much more of a lasting impression on me because it made me think about my own life and I was shaken up even after I finished watching it. Which goes for any form of media, but especially horror, since something that is important to bear in mind is that your audience already knows initially that you're trying to scare them and planting it right in front of their face isn't always going to achieve that goal when they're already expecting you to try and do that. And it doesn't make it in any way, shape, or form bad. I did enjoy it, and again, this is just a pilot and there's more to come, which will probably change the way I saw it. But it is an opinion I wanted to express. But yeah, this is getting extremely long, so I'm going to close it out here. Closing thoughts are to remember, again, for the millionth reiterated time, this is a pilot. This series has a lot of potential in my opinion, and I wouldn't make any long-lasting judgments and I would keep an open mind. And also, please don't let a fandom ruin any form of media for you. Something I've noticed is a lot of people discourage from enjoying it because they're nervous about how the fandom will choose to treat it, since indie projects in the past have been pretty much ruined by strange fandoms. Enjoy it for what it is, though, not how other people react to it. Refusing to try and enjoy content for no reason other than its popularity or because you don't like the type of people who do enjoy it is kind of lame and will make it difficult for you to foster interest that you may have potentially liked if you gave them a chance. If somehow you haven't watched the pilot yet up until this point, I encourage you to go do so if you get the chance. And yeah, that's it for today. Thank you for watching up until this point if you did. If you've got any thoughts I didn't mention yet or you have more to add on to the ones that I did, feel free to share them in the comment section. I hope you guys have a happy Halloween. Let me know what your plans are if you have any. I'm gonna go trick-or-treating with some friends and I'm hyped for it. Thank you for watching and as always, I'll see you guys next time.